breaking that news this week as we on the Eldritch Lawcast discuss the new unearthed arcana, hot off the press, wonders of the multiverse, which spins out into a conversation about feats and whether they're good for D&D 5e. All that and more right now. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, the number one D&D podcast in all the planes of existence, everyone out there, uh, the Eldritch Lawcast is the number one podcast. I'm losing track of what I'm saying already, but I am Ben Byrne and here as always with Sean Merwin, James Ake uh, and Dale Kingsmill. Dale, I have to ask, I've got a question here from Gethin uh, once again, who is asking if you could pick a ninth level spell to base a character around. So you're either doing like a one shot where you have access Ooh. to a ninth level spell or a campaign and like this spell is what your character wants to learn at the the climax of the campaign. What spell would you choose and what is that character? Ooh, that's a tricky. Now I got to remember some ninth level spells. Astral projection, is that a a ninth level thing? I'm going to be honest, the only ninth it's, level spell it's I know high the level. Is wish. It's up there somewhere. Um, and then I could be a charmed one. I could just be I, like Shannon Doherty. Was it Shannon Doherty in Charmed who could astral project? I think it was. That's the, that's my character. That's it. Uh, wow. James yeah. Hake, uh, ninth level spell, make a character. Meteor Swarm. Ooh. And I will bring an end to the age of dinosaurs on this campaign world. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, you've been biding your time. You're like, I don't like the dinosaurs in this setting. Let's get rid of them. I love the idea. Of- <laughs> They've had it too good for too long. <laughs> Doing a caveman campaign and then you are the ultimate BBEG at the end. <laughs> Ooh, worst nightmare. Uh, Sean Merwin, ninth level spell, make a character. I am going Grim Hollow here and I'm going to take Phoenix Flames. Ooh. Where you immolate Ooh. yourself to do damage to everything around you and then 10 minutes later, you come back to life. Cool. I, 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 I feel like I should be a savant in this uh, Grim Hollow knowledge, but I did not know about that spell. So that is an excellent pick right there. I feel You'll like that's- hearing from the company. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, ben, you need to know more about the products. That, um, <laughs> that feels like a lich spell. That feels like you, you've ascended to lichdom and now like whenever you are defeated, you're like Skeletor hitting the red button and like, I'll get your next time. Well, that's why I love- <laughs> Is that the atmosphere we're going with? Yeah, that's why I love these. I look at the spells from Wizards of the Coast. They're fine, but they're all the ones that you know, right? They do some damage <laughs> and they <laughs> stun somebody or they do damage all over the place. These spells, the other ninth level spell from the Grim Hollow Player's Guide is called Steel Immortality. And it's a reaction that Which you I take- no. It's a reaction that you take when an immortal creature that would normally go back to its plane when it reaches zero hit points, when that dies, you can cast that as a reaction and steal its immortality and you become whatever it was. If it's a fiend, you become fiendish. If it's an angel, I you, know, you become celestial. And then you get to be that until you are dropped to zero hit points. Uh, and then you go back to what you were. But you know, it's just such flavor. Not as opposed to just doing the big thing. Mm. Oh, I'm going to wish. Yeah, big deal. <laughs> I laugh because I was Get definitely wrecked. going to pick Wish. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, playing as a Janasi who ascends to being a genie over the course of the campaign. Oh, that'd be yeah. sick. Yeah, that's um, nice. So the, the ultimate uh, realization of that power is being able to cast Wish. Also, Wish may or may not be the only ninth level spell I know. You can't wind that back, Sean. You already said get wrecked to the Wish people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You heard it here first. Sean Merwin hates the spell Wish. <laughs> uh, yes, if you've been DMing for long enough, um, you will probably have come to hate that spell for so many different reasons. Uh, cool. All right. Well, there is a fair bit of news this week, um, uh, which has come down the pipeline, um, uh, not least of which is that One Bookshelf and Roll20, One Bookshelf, if you're if that name isn't familiar with you, the people or the company behind uh, DMs Guild, I'm going to say D&D Beyond when I mean DMs Guild at least once during this conversation. Um, but the people behind DMs Guild, they also do uh, drive through RPG, but I believe, and Sean, you might be able to correct me on this if I get this wrong, One Bookshelf is sort of the, the branching company that, that um, provides these online digital storefronts for uh, tabletop RPG products. 
Um, we talked a couple of weeks ago a little bit about how they had partnered with Roll20 uh, so that anything that you purchase on DMs Guild. Assuming that the author has also put in the extra effort of making digital online products. Will also be available <laughs> on uh, Roll20, which is amazing. Um, uh, but they have, in fact, announced that they are more than just partnering. They are merging. They are doing the, um, what's it called from Dragon Ball Z? The fusion dance. There we go. They're doing the fusion dance and becoming a single company, which, according to, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, I apologize, Ankit Lai, uh, who is the CEO, uh, I think, of Roll20, uh, saying that we, after this merger, this will be the best place to purchase, peruse, and play Tabletop RPGs online, period. Big statement. Sean, what do you feel this means for the tabletop RPG industry? What's your reaction to this news? I wish I had a crystal ball to know exactly what it means, but it is definitely interesting. And I have a feeling that Wizards of the Coast purchasing and integrating D&D Beyond was, was a catalyst that will now cause ripple effects throughout the industry. Uh, everyone who has worked or has licensed with Wizards of the Coast has been waiting to see what they're going to do about uh, online retail, about virtual tabletop, about digital tools, about all of these things. And so there's just everyone's been poised on the edge of their seat waiting to see. And when they bought D&D Beyond, that became the first indication of where they might be headed which then spurs everyone else into action. So this is, it makes mm. sense to me as these two companies by themselves are both leaders in their field, I would say, but together they are a more attractive, more powerful, more able to work out good deals with either Wizards of the Coast if they decide to go the acquisition route or with someone else if Wizards goes in a different direction and one bookshelf and roll 20 have to find a different partner in order to compete with Wizards of the Coast. It actually makes me think that uh, this merge makes a Wizards of the Coast acquisition less likely. Um, and something about that president's statement is what really gets me about it because he really emphasizes tabletop RPGs mm -hmm. in, in the statement. If, if, Wizards was trying to pull and acquire Roll20, integrate their VTT into D&D Beyond, put the DMs Guild underneath their banner sort of thing. I, I feel like the Roll20 CEO sort of like statement would have been a little bit more, I don't know, D&D heavy if, if that was something sure. that they planned in the near future. It is very like they have a, a you know, the, it's a lot of chest beating that goes in because it's both the the uh, previous CEO um, and I might get this wrong, but I took some very quick notes. Um, so Steve uh, Wick, who was the previous CEO of uh, One Bookshelf, is to become the president uh, of both companies, um, but he will be on the board uh, of directors, and then the CEO of Roll Twenty will become the CEO of the company. I don't know enough about companies to really know what that means. But the point being uh, that uh, both of them had quotes. I read uh, uh, the uh, Roll20 CEO was one a moment ago. Uh, Steve Week says, our mission from the get-go has always been to make it easier for publishers and creators to reach a wider audience of role-playing fans. And this is a bit of a cherry-picked quote from a larger quote that was in the article, um, which I think Sean tweeted, or maybe it was Phil from Ghostfire tweeted it. Um, but it, uh, there was a lot of like, you know, Wizards of the Coast, they mentioned Chaosium, they mentioned Paizo, they mentioned, you know, like we are here for anyone and everyone. So that, that well, might just be like them saying that, but, um. No, I think this is, I think this is it. I think it's becoming a little bit clearer as, as, you know, moves are made and time goes on and what you've just been saying, what James was saying, the idea that, um, tabletop RPG is their focus rather than D and D now that just it to me that makes so much sense for them to go ah i see the direction d and d is going in we have to protect ourselves by solidifying this other thing that we that both roll 20 and one bookshelf have had going for them from the beginning that kind of has taken a little bit of backseat because d and d is such a juggernaut and like mm. when you can get that that deal with them why not take it right but from the beginning 
drive through RPG and uh, Roll20 have both had this incredible background in supporting other tabletop RPGs and they can be officially published games. Uh, you know, you, you can get a ton of like, like if you want to buy Fiasco, go to drive through RPG and look for the PDF, right? Like that's, that's the place that you go for any number of those. And then on top of that, super duper indie people can, can use these programs as well. You know, I think of, um, a friend of mine, Nyessa, who, who designs cool little indie RPGs, designed a card-based game called At the Monarch's Gate that uses tarot, a tarot deck. And you can play that on Roll20. The game, like the, the platform supports that game, even though it has such a wildly different mechanical basis. And it's just like, I, I don't know why I didn't see it coming, because it is a really smart move to really just go, all right, if they're moving in that direction, let's do something to solidify our base, not even necessarily with a specific group, like not, not necessarily just teaming up with Chaosium and being like, this is our, you know, new horse that we've picked. Instead, just going, actually, we're the platform for every other game. No, Dale, I, I think what you're saying is especially true because we're entering a time for D&D that's incredibly transitional. And it doesn't actually make a lot of sense, I think, for people to put their support really strongly in the D&D camp because a new edition, whether or not we want to call it that, of D&D is happening within the next few years. This current edition is beloved as it is, as accessible as it is, getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, I feel like the the 5e criticism is reaching a, a, a new high watermark. Uh, it's, it's very wise, I think, for people like Roll20 and One Bookshelf and the new entity they've become to really say, D&D will do whatever it does. And we don't want to get mired in whatever is going on around it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that you're saying. The only small point that you're missing is while one bookshelf can have any game it wants on there, Roll20 can have any game it wants on there. And that's, that's very true, and it's great for the consumers. Uh, it's great for one bookshelf, and it's great for Roll20. And if Wizard says it's going to cost us hundred million dollars to create what one bookshelf and roll 20 has. So we're going to offer them 75 million dollars. One bookshelf and roll yeah. roll 20 may look at their books and say, we would have to work 200 years based on the consumers that we have right now that don't play D and D. So we might want to move in that direction. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that's the case. Uh, I'm saying that's the <laughs> money is, is a thing that people tend to like to collect. And no, and it just yeah. it just solidifies their position even more, no matter what direction things end up going yeah. in. You're you're exactly right. I'd be curious to know, and I'm sure Roll Twenty and uh, One Bookshelf have these numbers, but in terms of like that decision making for them, um, what percentage of people are on Roll Twenty, sort of specifically playing D and D versus any other tabletop RPG, and is that reflective? of the popularity of D&D compared to any other tabletop RPG in general? Like, we know D&D is super popular, but is it like 60-40 and then it's 80-20 on Roll20 or like... There's a quarterly report, I think, the, that the OR group does, O-R-R. -R. <laughs> Sean might be looking for that right this very second. Um, when I was on N-World a lot, I, I saw those quarterly reports. And, you know, four, five, six, seven years ago, uh, D and D was such an enormous top dog. It was, it, you know, it's it's not even funny how massive of a percentage of even Roll Twenty, which I think is a slightly more diverse in terms of the games they play group than the average, you know, than than the world population. Mm. <laughs> it's taking a while, but yes, the stats are out there. You can find them, and it's very heavily, heavily, heavily skewed toward D and D. As in, like, more people are playing third edition D&D on Roll20 than, like, any other game. Right. Yeah, that, that's, that's the sort of... I think, yeah. I think I'm remembering that right. So that's the sort of skew that we're looking at, which is why it calls into question. If Wizards wanted to go that direction, I don't think Roll20 or One Bookshelf would say no. Now, One Bookshelf is in a little different position because they do have a huge you know catalog of content 
that they're getting from roll 20 mm-hmm. is in a little bit if if someone says roll you can't use roll 20 to play D on right or, or just something like that that would be a huge huge hit uh to their to their bottom line well, yeah, that, that's a good point because if third, edi- even if earlier editions of D&D are the primary game that's getting played on Roll20 and where Roll20 is making a lot of its revenue, there ain't no third edition on D&D Beyond, you know, and we've mm. talked a little bit in the past when Wizards do um, roll forward to 5.5 or 6th edition, whatever that ends up looking like, likely that is going to be rolled over on D&D Beyond based on the fact that they rolled over Volos and Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. They were just like, yep, yeah, no, these are Monsters of the Multiverse now. If you have those older purchases, they're there. Um, which, just side note, is super useful because uh, as someone who has all of those purchases on D&D Beyond, it shows you legacy, uh, like version of a mind witness and modern version of a mind witness, which makes it very easy to compare the two stat blocks just a, instead of flipping through the two books. Just a side note. Um, I think from a consumer's point of view, this is just another reminder uh, in the myriad of reminders that, you know, living in the streaming service age gives us to um, go ahead and buy print media anyway. Go ahead and buy physical media so you can archive it on your own. Um, Me and my DVD collection are justified. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's that's really the thing is that you don't own this stuff. Not really. You're, you're licensing it and they may call it ownership, but like, you know, you buy a movie on Disney plus, uh, it's basically no different from permanently renting it. Yeah. Yeah. People and the same goes for D&D when a video game days. company says we're no longer supporting these servers and everyone goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> We've been saying. Uh, Cosmic Postman has just posted in the Twitch chat. But apparently a new Unearthed Arcana has just dropped. Um, yes, <gasps> best in all the planes indeed. <laughs> Freshest of fresh. Wonders of the multiverse. Thank you. I was having a little bit of difficulty finding it. Now Sean and I are both looking for things. Um, <laughs> good luck, Dante, uh, when you edit this yeah, later. Good luck. Um, okay, so this is all uh, multiverse. This is live react. Spe- <laughs> Oh! Um, I don't know what that was. <laughs> that was the thumbnail for live reactive. Yeah. Great. We Gotta have it for clicks. this week. <laughs> um, uh, gl- is this spell jam? Like, I don't recognize Glitchling as a as something that I recognize. Is this, this spell jam this related? Is, I've never seen the Glitchling before, but all of this has a very plain scapey sort of feel to me. This wouldn't be for the upcoming spell jammer book, would it? It's too late. I would imagine. No, no, I, I don't think so. Uh, Planescape has a long history of having the Great Modron March as a backbone of its adventuring. And whenever Wizards puts out something that talks about mechanical servants of law, I can't help but think of the Modrons. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, new Modron-like race. The other thing I've just noticed in here... First reacts as I scan this document, giant foundling as a background, which is a callback to giants, uh, which they did an unearthed arcana on not that long ago. And we Mm -hmm. were talking about like, are they doing a Storm King's Thunder follow up or something like that? Um, Do you think they might be doing a Kaldheim magic setting, the Norse inspired Magic the Gathering set? Mm, That's a good call. I don't know enough about it. Interesting premise. Well, they do talk here about giants, primordial magic, uh, rune carving. That does seem to have yeah. this sort of, you know, Norse-inspired mm. uh, theme. So that would make sense. And it's been a little while since the last Magic: The Gathering official book. You know what I mean? Like it, the, yeah, it just seems like good one? filler stuff in between to buy time between. It was Strixhaven. <laughs> Other. Strixhaven and Strixhaven was quite well received. Oh, I forgot about Strixhaven. How did I forget about Strixhaven? I loved it so much. Was oh, that the no. college uh, one? You, yes. you loved it so much you forgot it was I loved a magic it so setting. Much I forgot about it. In my defense, the one before it was Theros, and I I have a, a necessary loyalty to Theros. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Are those the three? Theros, Strixhaven, and Ravnica so far? Because uh, I, I didn't know yeah, the others there were. Was, there was a thing that was in a strad somewhere in there, but it wasn't a book. So that's plane shift. That's, yeah. Um, so James Wyatt. That's what you're thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> Back on the DMs Guild, I believe James Wyatt did very small little free conversions of some magic settings, which I think included uh, Innistrad, Zendikar, and Ixalan. I might be I might be very that wrong. That checks out. Those are those are some of the like really poppy settings. Like mm-hmm. they 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 are eye catching. I would love something that was like super Innistrad, but it is it does tread on the toes of of Curse of Strad a little bit. So I mean I do feel like Curse of Innistrad is just like waiting to, <laughs> it's be, right to be picked up. It's yeah. right, right it's right there. there. <laughs> uh Spirit of Death, new spell. Looks kinda cool. You call forth a spirit of death. I just saw the stat blocks. I was like, you monsters! Oh new spell. Um which is generally my reaction. Interesting. Um, just quickly jumping back, Sean, were you able to find the the um, stats that you were looking at before? No, no problem. If not, I just thought I'd ask. The last I can find is from the final quarter of 2021, where 55% of the campaigns that were created on Roll20 were, were 5e D&D. Um, the next single game was 9.3% Call of Cthulhu, any edition. Uh, Next was Pathfinder first edition at three percent. Pathfinder second edition was one percent, right alongside Warhammer and D and D third edition. Ooh. Yep. So yeah, a, a good chunk. Yeah. It really tells you yeah. something about the nature of the industry, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think just two quick things is first to quickly vox pop the Twitch chat and ask, do you as a player assume feats are in the game or do you see them as optional and wait for the GM to let you know? Because I feel like in every game I've played, um, I've never disallowed them, but the players have never asked. They've never been like, oh, are feats allowed? They're like, all right, we're starting this campaign at level five and half the party have a feat kind of baked into their character um, and the other thing is we use the alternate human um, variant uh, kind of rules to make that more interesting at first level as well. The second thing is I don't think they're balanced in fifth edition against each other specifically at all because, James, you mentioned the three Sentinel, Pol- uh, uh, Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter, the three king uh, feats that nobody takes. And I was literally looking at them yesterday Um for a video that we're doing where I was like, oh, I wonder what feats would kind of match with this particular thing that I'm going for. And I didn't want to hit Sentinel, Polearm, uh, wet, sorry, Polearm Master and Sentinel are very popular together because um, you kind of paralyze your foe as they're coming. So that's why I keep making that mistake. But Great Weapon Master and Sharpshooter, what else is in here? And uh, it's like, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. No player ever takes that. Oh, I can see why that's cool. But I also know why no player ever takes it because it's just, you know, it's like shield, shield master, I think is amazing because it allows you, it just keep, summons that image of the knight with the shield kind of deflecting the dragon's breath as it breathes down on it. But that's so situational that like you don't really get anything out of it compared to great weapon master, which can be used every time you attack just about. Um, second question for the chat and actually for you three as well is if you use Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter specifically, do you homebrew it in any way to kind of pull back the power of those two abilities? Or are you just like, yep, no, that's fine, or ban them entirely? We don't, I, don't <laughs> think, I don't think I've ever um, felt the need to homebrew them even though they are very strong. I will say, uh, if we're Vox Popping chat, let me also just use the anecdotal evidence of my comment section on YouTube. Once again, mm-hmm. people absolutely assume that feats are involved. The number of times I've made a video that hinges on, you know, some kind of imbalance in the game and people say, well, that's not true because of X feet. And I'm like, okay, but you understand that those are optional, right? Yeah. So you can't just assume that the DM is using those rules. Um, and the, I get a lot of pushback for that because the assumption is that everyone must be using feats. Can can I just touch on how much I love vox popping as a verb? That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I want to use that in everyday life mm-hmm. now. Um, but no, I I mean my my party doesn't uh, doesn't really use very many feats at all. Uh, the the in fact the the one sort of optimization lover uh, in my group has taken. Uh, 
has made this very funky uh, little rogue barbarian goblin build that completely sidesteps both of those powerhouse feats of Great Open Master and Sharpshooter. And it's like, he's doing great without the need of those two. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, I'm about to give my characters some feats as rewards, and those will probably be the most feats that anyone has taken in, in this entire campaign. And it's not because I banned them, it's just because this group is one that isn't super interested on the whole in that level of character customization. And gotcha. they, they would rather come to me and say, hey, I want to do this, how can I do it? And the point that James makes there is perfect because his group doesn't use feats or doesn't use them extensively, and even the, the power gamer in his group doesn't. And they do just fine. If you have a game Mm -hmm. where you don't have to use all of these super powerful broken things and the game works just fine, what happens when you do add them? What happens when you get Uh. three power gamers who are using them and then three players who maybe aren't as familiar with the rules or don't? How do they work together then? Are they playing the same game, having the same amount of fun? That's where these optional rules get into uh game design purgatory territory (laughs) and i mean there's it's it's stuff like um you know the the hardcore the the key martial classes right like if you look at the fighter this is kind of where i think you get the most um push and pull with it because a key element of the the fighter as a class is that they get more um stages where they get to choose ability score increases or possibly a feat if the DM allows them. And so you end up with this uh, this thing of, oh, fighters aren't underpowered because they get to choose a bunch of feats and p- sure. feats are very powerful. And that does bring them up to a level akin to someone like a mage, right? Um, because you get to do all this like wild stuff um, that is basically out of like a martial arts film. And, uh, and that's really cool. But as soon as you start getting into the zone of okay, but the mages can also choose feats. And, you know, these other powerful classes can also choose feats as soon as you are allowing feats, you end up with that imbalance. Again, I think it's important to acknowledge that balance, to me at least, I don't I don't necessarily care about actual mechanical balance. I'm not I- even entirely sure that it is fully achievable in a game like this. But the important thing for me is a balance of fun. Is everyone having the same or similar amounts of fun with their characters and the things that they can do with them. And I think that's a space that feats can really um, kind of, I want to say help with, but they could also impact it negatively. So I don't know. They just, they have a lot of sway. Yeah. I mean, the the thing about feats in 5e when the fighter is concerned is it feels very strongly of a relic of bonus feats mm-hmm. from third edition where fighters got so many more feats. You know, everyone got a feat every third level, I think, in third edition. Fighters were getting them left, right, and center, uh, mostly because they needed them to be functional because there were a lot of feats. Feats were very small. And just thinking about this, I'm I'm worried about rescinding my previous statement about wanting small feats back because <laughs> I, I start to imagine the third edition player's handbook in my Who mind and I can feel my here, sanity okay? slipping away. Uh, but, you know, there is like, well, I... I need to take weapon focused long swords so that I can get a plus one to hit so I can stay up to date with the, the, the accuracy curve. And I need to take improved weapon focus in order to, you know, keep up to date with the damage curve. And then so somewhere along the line, superior weapon focus. And now all of a sudden I can only use a long sword because all of my feats are geared towards being good with a long sword. No, someone sundered my long sword because they took the feat that lets them sunder weapons really well. And ah, I'm getting and suddenly... flashbacks to choosing classes for uni <laughs> and just like, okay, what are my prerequisites? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <What do> I- <laughs> and and there's something very there's something very fun and like tactile about the choosing of those feats i feel there's something fun about building a character but i think the tires kind of fall off the car once the rubber hits the road uh and uh I'm going to extend this metaphor beyond its point of usefulness. But, you know, once the first flat tire comes around, it's like <laughs> uh, there, there's no way to there's no way to, to fix the problem anymore. Not really. And one thing one thing that has exacerbated the problem is the Internet, because back in the day, you could find this mm. really powerful combination, but you couldn't share it with anyone. You could share it with your home group. And they but now 
I know that my home group, God bless them all, uh, you know, they go to the internet optimization forums and they're like, oh, I'm going to do this and this. And then half the time they don't really know how it works. They just saw it. And so they yeah. start to try to pull mm. it out at the table. I was like, you know, you can't do that. Did you want to do this instead? And and so not only are they trying to break the game, but they can't even do it correctly. So it's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, Look it's up a, one of those color-coded guides and you're like, this one is in gold, so it's probably good. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just jumping back a little bit uh, to what you were saying earlier, Sean, uh, and also Dale in terms of balancing fun at the table, balancing everybody's fun and how mechanical balance kind of ties into that. My personal ballast with feats, so to speak, uh, in terms of balancing it out, is asking everybody to take point by at the start of the campaign so that their ability scores aren't huge. So even for the fighter, every time it comes to an ability score improvement, it's a real choice between taking a feat and an ability score improvement. It's not like First, first one comes along, uh, my strength is already at plus five or my dex is already at plus four, whatever. I'll just take a feat, but it's actually, you know, part of the branching possibilities for the character. Um, I have at my table, God's bless them both because I love them both, but I have two players that are polar opposites where one wants to hit things and wants to hit them hard. And they introduced me to Great Weapon Master uh, during a campaign because they love the feeling of being powerful at the table. And they're not a min-maxer per se, but they just like to build beefy, powerful, one hit and it goes down sort of characters. And another player who loves, uh, loves what's the word I'm looking for? like hardship for their characters, you know, (laughs) loves to play a deliberately mechanical busted and by busted I mean like weak uh, Mm -hmm. character where they're playing a bard but they put all their, uh, you know, points into intelligence because what they want to do is play like someone who's historically really um, uh, intelligent but really bad at telling stories, so to speak. Um, And having them both in the same campaign becomes a balance between uh, putting the party through hardship uh, and making it feel like the campaign is a challenge that they need to continually overcome, but also giving them moments where that player who loves to feel, you know, and they all do in different balances, in different uh, uh, scales, feel like they can really, you know, um, wail on a monster and, and, and just chop its head off and bathe in its blood and not feel bad about it. Um, and so just the great weapon master and sharpshooter, the two quick balances I put on those were that they tie to your strength and or dex, uh, modifier. So you can own, is that a lamington? I love lamingtons. Lamingtons are like my, sorry, that's just, if you could have pulled up any other dessert, then I wouldn't have said anything, <laughs> but a lamington in particular is just the most Australian thing you could have pulled out of the, <laughs> like you could have pulled out Vegemite toast, you know, you could have pulled out anything. Sean and James, do you even know what a, la- like, do you know what a lamington is? Is this a, an American, uh, no Ben, but when I'm there, I'm counting on you to get me one. Now. I love lamingtons. They are just about my favorite dessert. I just got hungry. I hadn't had breakfast. There were lamingtons on my desk. <laughs> That's fine, Dale. Don't feel bad. Um, uh, yeah, the ty- uh, they can only use Great Weapon Master and equivocal times to their strength modifier and then long rest. The handy tip for you. Um, uh, we have blasted through this episode. So I think we've got about 10 maybe 20 minutes left. I'm not sure what time we actually started the episode. Um, That was just me being like, I think the feet should be somewhere else in the document. (laughs) No, great, great conversation. I I enjoyed it very much. That's content, Dale. Exactly. Um, But speaking of 5.5 and 6E, I mean, this is the smallest of hints. This might not be a full topic. I don't know. Um, But Ray, I assume Winninger is the way that's pronounced, Uh, one of uh, Wizards of the Coast staff members. Uh, has tweeted that he, Jeremy Crawford, Chris Perkins have gotten together and that I believe Chris Perkins' dog is the most adorable uh, dog in the world. Uh, And that's the news. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) They talked about working on the next iteration of D&D, I believe they called it. Uh, The next versions of the core books is what actually took my, um, uh, my notice in particular and that we will get a first look soon. Um, all in quotation marks, because that's the exact quote. But what do we take that to mean? Uh, that means that we 
uh, know that it's coming, but if if we are going to see something soon, that means they have been working on it for probably two years. Uh, so it's not like they just sat down and had a meeting. I saw the same message and I can't couldn't go back to find it, but it was so cute because uh, Ray was talking about Milo sitting on his lap while they're <laughs> talking. And you know, made it sound like this is just the start of the conversation. And the unearthed arcana that just dropped is, you know, we're probably, like I said, several months, if not years, into the design of this game. So th- this this isn't new news. This is, uh, I think it was more about Milo than it was about the game. Yeah, fair. <laughs> it's, it's very cheeky of Ray to obfuscate the process like this. <laughs> All right, with the time that we have left, last bit of news uh, and then uh, a listener email. Hopefully we'll have time for it because this new news is pretty big, just bracing. Sean, let me ask you. you got to go out. You're going to an event. Uh, you're going to some sort of special occasion. Uh, you're putting on a shirt. Uh, you're wearing a, 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 any other particular item of clothing uh, with your shirt and, and sports jacket. I can't think of the last time I wore a sports jacket or even like a, a regular sort of Oxford shirt. Uh, I'm definitely not wearing a tie, but I'll tell you what, if I was. <laughs> <laughs> Can I interest you? Thank you for not making me go through everyone. Can I interest you? <laughs> In a uh, games workshop uh, necktie, very stylish, very subtle. Looks like it comes with a little pin on the end of the tie. Uh, sort of the, the the they come in two two flavors, if you will: uh, corn red and ultramarines blue, which may only mean anything to anybody who uh, plays Warhammer Forty K. But the 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 corn red in particular looks like just a nice paisley red tie from a distance but you get up close to it and you see the seven pointed star and the skulls uh kind of mixed into that pattern uh very tasteful uh from from the same people merchoid uh not affiliated with this podcast in any way just for the record uh who brought us the games workshop scented candles well now you can light your candle uh uh do up your tie and get ready for a night on the town uh in the name of the lord of skulls so so while wearing this tie, can I drink my breakfast cereal out of the bowl <laughs> with a handle? This is the tie. This is the part of the podcast. This is my segment, my personal segment where I get upset about strange merch. <laughs> this is this is my segment to get excited about strange merch. This, um, this, this is cruel and unusual punishment. Is what together, it is. they keep the universe in balance. You know, yeah, exactly. if you had any class, you would use the tie to soak up the milk from your cereal. <laughs> Ring it that's out how you when you need it later. That's how real people drink the milk from their bowl. And that's yeah, why yeah, that's that's a that's a chaos deity move. Yeah, right that's there. why I don't wear ties because it's always getting in my food. We are going to finish off with a quick lit- a listener, uh, pardon me, listener question uh, coming in from Gethin who asked about. Oh wait, before I forget, because I feel like I forget this every time. Podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. That is where For you can record. send your questions. On the run sheet, it's podcast in all caps. <laughs> yes, so podcast I don't forget. Podcast at Ghostfired Gaming. I, I almost legitimately forgot to do it and I gave myself a big capitalised note not to. Podcast at ghostfiregaming.com. Send your emails there. Ask us questions. You can also comment below this video um, if you're watching this on YouTube um, where I do also go for questions that have been asked uh, and put them to the panel. Gethin is asking uh, about reflecting on GM mistakes and internalizing lessons for later, feeling that they didn't run a particularly strong uh, Vecna one shot using the, the free one shot from a couple of weeks ago. They didn't go into the specifics of what they uh, felt they didn't do well, but the point of the email was more about how do you reflect on your uh, mistakes as a game master and then learn lessons to improve for later. Uh, And I just quick follow up to that is um, my thought legitimately identifying mistakes rather than internalizing GM anxiety, which I feel is something that GMs can do by mistake instead. Uh, Handball over to the panel. I can go. Um, (laughs) So I get mad GM anxiety all the time. um, And I think in a weird way, I, th- I mean, okay. Uh, 
I have mental illness. Um, and I find that it can be uh, really helpful if I start getting uh, super depressed or super anxious and I identify that feeling. I like to sort of chase it down the rabbit hole and find when I started feeling that way. Um, and, you know, maybe that's not helpful for other people, but I find it really useful. And um, particularly if, if I'm feeling anxious about a game that I've run, if I chase it back and I think this is when I started feeling anxious about it, um, I can try to take action on that thing. So even if it is um, to some degree just an internalized anxiety and it's not something that is like ruining anyone's time, rather than letting it become just negative head talk, I uh, try to think, okay, well, what would make me happier about that in the future? You mm -hmm. know, um, so amongst those things, one of my go-to examples is that um, I started feeling like Every time I ran combat with a map, with a with a battle map, I felt like uh, it it became messy. The players weren't paying attention, and I was doing a bad job of describing things. And so eventually, I chased that back, and I went, you know what? Times that I have run the game without using a battle map, I've had a better time. So let me try to figure out a way that I can, you know, rely more on theater of the mind than on battle maps. So that's just one example, but you know, it's it's just. Is there something I can do that will make me feel better the next time that I do this is kind of my go-to thing. You can, just as you would have a session zero before a campaign or a game starts, you can, after a game, ask the players, did you have fun? Ask them as a group. And then, if you are in contact with that group, if it's your home campaign, contact each of them individually. How's the game working for you? Are you having fun? Is there anything I could do different? Then... You are hearing from you know the people who you are hopefully there to interact with if they are having fun. And if they tell you they are, believe them. Uh, that, that's, that's pretty much as simple as, as it is. If the players are having fun, even if you mess something up, if you get a rule wrong, if you get the NPC's name wrong, those are little things and they always happen. Uh, the big things you can, you can rely on your players to let you know if there is an issue that you need to address. That's something that, that I've done for a very long time. And it's very, very good advice, uh, with me who often does succumb to anxiety. Um, I can get trapped in kind of an endless cycle of that where every week I'll be like, Oh, please tell me you did a good job. Cause otherwise I won't believe it myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, if you if you ask players for their feedback when you know everything's going well and you do it a lot, uh, you may be overly anxious about your D and D game. And asking your players for help uh, after a certain point, or asking your players for their feedback after a certain point, um, will become a crutch for you, and indeed may start to negatively impact your players' enjoyment of the game, um, because then, well. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> don't 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 worry about that. Uh, the 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 thing is when you're at when you're at that point, the the only way to help yourself through that anxiety is is on your own terms. You need to find a, an internal way to to feel good about the game you've just run, and not worry so much about whether or not everyone had the time of their life. Yeah, it was a good time. That's. Good enough. That's yeah, exact. That's a really good way of putting it because it it is so easy to get caught up in your head and be upset about things you don't need to be upset about. Like don't don't get into the trap of overthinking. Like get, go easy on yourself. You yeah. It's it's fine. You actually it doesn't actually matter if you screwed something up. It, it this is a D and D game. It is it is for fun, and your friends still like you. Like. Mm. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a piece of advice which stuck with me actually from when I was uh, doing my master's in education to become a teacher. Um, uh, and we had to, as part of a media class, we had, we had a whiz bang media lecturer um, who asked us to do like 20 minutes of a lesson was a, and, and we treat the rest of our university peers as if they're like a year seven class of media students or year nine class of media students, whatever. And you come in and you do the lesson. And everybody planned out these whiz bang, like here's a really tactile activity. We're going to watch like a bit of a movie and then stop and talk about it and then watch a bit of a movie again. Or, you know, here's all these magazines, cut out like what you find interesting in these magazines and make a collab, you know, all these like really involved, uh, engaging activities because we wanted to do well on the assessment. 
Um, and there was a piece of advice which that lecturer gave, which was like, these are all great lessons, but not every class can be this. You know, you can't put this much preparation into every lesson that you teach because uh, you're doing three or four lessons a week, if not more than that, in addition to all the other classes that you have to teach with what other, other subject you do. And you might run, you know, translating that to doing sessions at D&D, you might run one session a week, you might run one session a month. But the point being that, like, you know, everybody's so online right now, you see constantly, I saw on Twitter before, somebody uploaded their, like, this is the final boss dungeon uh, climax of my oh, campaign. And it's this amazing 3D, you know, um, uh, physical terrain with the painted miniatures and everything. Um, and I was like, man, I'd love to do that for my final session. But, uh, you know, not feeling like every session needs to be that, you know, or not even feeling like your climax needs to necessarily be that. Sort of mixing two bits of advice here, which is not every session needs to be the climax of the campaign. Some sessions are just there to get you through the next bit of the story or just to hang out with friends. And uh, you you don't need to compare the game that you run against any every other game uh, that gets run online either, whether it's a live play, whether it's in pictures, whether it's in, you know, whatever it happens to, to be. Um, and I just want to also echo, Dale, what you said about uh, identifying having an anxious thought, um, knowing when it's anxiety and that like learning that is a skill, um, that, um, is probably like a, you know, I'm not a psychologist, so don't take this advice as any sort of gospel or medical advice, but just, it, it's something that helped me a lot with my anxiety was just identifying, am I, is this something I legitimately need to be concerned about or am I just beating myself up over, uh, for, for anxiety reasons? Um, one thing that might give solace to anyone who feels like their DMing isn't great. When we were running games at Gen Con and Origins and all the big ones, uh, there was a way that we could ru rule out DMs that might need some help by handing out evaluation forms to the players at the end of the game. Because we want to make sure players who are mm. spending $15 you know, to play a four-hour game are getting their money's worth. And you know, just to make sure... And, you know, the, it was a scale of one to five in different categories that ended up with a score. It could be five or, or lower. So the top of the line, great DMs were getting like 4.98, you know, for their average score. The, the, the DMs who were new and maybe learning and maybe didn't have their feet under them were getting something like 4.7 uh, for their scores. <laughs> Which goes to tell you that people are just happy to be playing the game. And so remember yeah. that, right? You, you're having fun as the game master, but you are giving fun to all of your players. So even those DMs who are professional or are being rated, uh, right? They're just, the players are just having fun and they're just there. So thank you for doing all that you do dms i'm glad that you brought that back around sean because i dead set thought what you were going to say then was like and that's how we weeded out the crap dms uh <laughs> and this is this is what they were doing wrong the players said they, they did bad role play or the players um just to not play devil's advocate so much but just you know for uh, advice on the flip side i mean i think dale you mentioned an example um, that was tied into a, a sense of anxiety around DMing, but also was a practical example of how you improved your game going from using a grid to, to not using a grid just for the sake of, of people that, you know, may have received some kind, hopefully, feedback from their players that, like, we really prefer it when the game is um, mechanically crunchier or we really prefer it when this happens or maybe the GM is not having fun and they can't work out uh, why they're not having fun um, that might be tied to a practical thing in the game. Are there any examples that you guys can think of um, that uh, that you're like, yes, I improved my game tangibly when I stopped doing this or I started doing this or whatever it, it sort of happens to be? I can definitely say that I started DMing much, much better in terms of being able to understand what players want when I started playing in public. Not DMing in public, just playing in public and going from game master to game master to game master, you know, over the course of several slots, several sessions, and seeing all the different kinds of game masters, all the tricks that these game masters used, uh, and even the ones that maybe weren't as mm -hmm. strong, those were cautionary tales or things that are like, oh, I recognize that in myself. 
And if I can see it as a player, then as a game master, I can do something to beef up that part of the game. You know, it's like anything. Mm-hmm. It's what is it the ten thousand hours principle, uh, right? It it just keep doing it. Watch other people do it. Uh, become a mentee or a mentor of of someone, and and just mm-hmm. continue to share knowledge and and share the joy of the game. And and y- you're already there. Uh, it's just a matter of continuing to do it. I couldn't have said it any better myself. Yeah, that's incredible advice. I think um, as someone who is, of all the hours that I have played D&D or any tabletop role-playing game just about, it's probably some statistic like 98.7% or 99.2% of the time I have been the game master or the storyteller or the whatever it happens to be. I've been a player very rarely to the point where I think for the first couple years of playing D&D, I was never the player. Like I played my very two sessions first, very first two sessions as a player and never after that. Um, if you are a forever DM, make a point to be a player at least in a couple of games because uh, with different GMs, exactly as Sean has said, because you start to learn what you like and what you don't like, but it also gives you that flip side view of the screen where you're like, oh, is that what it's like when I do that? Because I, uh, uh, for example, um, you know, when I used my own homebrew setting, was pretty strict about like, this is what exists in this campaign world and this isn't what exists in this campaign world. And I think that's kind of fine at character creation when you're pitching the campaign to the players, get them feeling like they're part of the world, but then not yes ending them in in the game world and being like oh well actually religion works more like this in the campaign or oh well actually you know the you wouldn't have said that because of this specific obscure piece of law that only i know because i'm the game master i experienced that from a player's perspective and i was like is that what i sound like all right now i know to yes and more often than you know no and or no but um unless it's like specifically important to the the campaign um as it's being run and that's a podcast absolutely that <laughs> is a uh that is an episode of the eldritch law cast uh we are wrapping up uh if you have a question like gethin and want to send it in for us to discuss debate um argue over um pontificate while we munch on our lamingtons uh email podcast at ghostfiregaming.com uh we're on twitch at 7 p.m eastern standard time or eastern daylight time i suppose at the moment uh 4 p.m pacific uh and 9 a.m tuesday um uh australian time monday for the for the pacific and eastern standard times um, I'm getting good at this. You can tell. Anyway, <laughs> my name is so Ben Burn. Uh, I've been here with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake, Sean Merwin, and we will catch you again next week for another episode of the Eldritch Lawcast. No drum line this week, just yeah. dancing. Yeah, just silent dancing. It's sort of a silent disco feel to this one. <laughs> you could probably hear my spine crack as I tried to do that. <laughs>